My company is called Design Ethos. Um, I say architect, well, sort of, kind of as a joke, keep things kind of light. Um, I am an architect by trade, but I started out doing master planning. So city and regional planning is actually where my degree is. And I got into site planning and master planning, working for a, a medium-sized architecture firm. And it was what we would call like big A, little P. So a lot of architecture, and a little bit of planning, but over time the, the planning department kind of grew. And I got, you know, kind of well-versed in that and then started working in illustration and in 3D and doing renderings and watercolors and all those kinds of things, which now is kind of a, a dying art and everybody's going digital. So I just sort of joke and say, well, sort of, because I actually got a chance to dip my hands into lots of different buckets, whereas most architects, not to their discredit, they really tend to only focus on the building and maybe a little bit of the site around it. I was very fortunate to uh, work under some folks that taught me how to look at the context, look at um, really land development. So, you know, acres of parcels, uh, densities, lot coverages, setbacks, all those kinds of things, all everything from the, the zoning code that most architects really only focus on the building code, and those two things are not always related. So, um, can you click a slide? Yeah. Uh, this is a little bit so, I like to start with a little dad joke. <laughs> Why did the architect get fired for his library design? because it only had one story. <laughs> I like dumb jokes. Okay, next please. Uh, a little bit about me, so um, I love to surf. Uh, this is San Onofre in, uh, in um, South Orange County, so I get out there as, as often as I can. You're glowing a little bit. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the sun. That's <laughs> next, not the radiation. Uh, yeah, it's the radiation from me. Okay, um, this is kind of fun. Does anybody know what, what building that is? Uh, the yeah, the Burj, Burj Khalifa in Dubai. So I had a chance to go to Dubai quite a few times for work. So um, I didn't design that building. Uh, next. I designed that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, a lot, of, a lot of architects have pretty strong egos. I try to keep it um, pretty down low. Is that so, the tallest building in the world? It is still currently. We'll see who comes up with the one next. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it was fantastic work on. This is also in Dubai. Anybody know what that one is? Burj Al Arab. Yeah, this, I just put this in there because that's my favorite building in the whole world. That thing is just beautiful, and uh, and of course it's right on the water. Next. Um, okay, so basically from that end of the spectrum, this is what I do most of the time: is single family residential, um, and I love it. I've worked on projects in hospitality, uh, commercial. Um, a little bit of medical clinics and stuff like that, but residential is really my game. So that's, that's kind of where I stay, that's my, that's my business. Next. How do construction workers party? They raise the roof. <laughs> more than okay. uh, so this is kind of how I started out my career, doing a lot of uh, master plan communities. Um, I was very fortunate to work with uh, Irvine Company and did a lot of their neighborhoods. I will not stand here and say that I designed all of it because I've heard people do that and I'm like, no, you didn't. So I got chances to work on parcels of projects, and we would always know things by their PA number, planning area six, planning area nine, planning area whatever, and then later it becomes Stone Gate and Orchard Hills and, you know, all the marketing names. And a lot of times when I meet people and they say, oh, I live in such and such, I have no idea of what, what that used to be, because that was passed down from the market. So that's how I spent my the first part of my career in, in 2D from up above. Next. Um, this is uh, one of those neighborhoods on the 133 on the way down to Laguna Beach. I think it's called Laguna Altura, maybe? Anyway, again, I knew it as its, as its previous name. So I got to work on the site planning and then also on the architecture for some of these homes because they would parcel out those to different builders. John Lang Homes, William Lyon Homes, uh, Brookfield Homes, you, you name it. Some of those bigger, bigger home builders. Next. So you're saying that in one neighborhood, they have many different builders? Absolutely, so Irvine Company, just uh, as a quick, as a very, very brief history, you know, obviously they were the Irvine Ranch, then they decided they could make a whole lot of money uh, slowly parceling out and selling off land. So Irvine Company would go through the process with the city of Irvine, which was not very difficult for them because they already owned all the land. And they would basically take large chunks, let's say maybe 20, 30, 100, 200 acres, and then they would get those 
done in the tentative maps, and then they would take pieces of those or parcels or planning areas, and they would sell those off to builders, um, nat national builders, let's say, and they even had their own building division in-house, and then they would build the homes. So, from, so that was like the land transaction, is that Irvine Company would sell land to a home builder. Mm -hmm. The home builder would then take that land, build the homes, and sell the homes, that's their transaction. So one of the great things about working with those guys and in that style is that you get to plan out neighborhoods and you get to plan out streets and homes and all those kinds of things. So you're affecting a lot of people. The downside is that you really don't know kind of who you're affecting. You're not working with the end user. You're not working with the couple or the family that's going to move into the home. So you're always guessing what is it that they would like. Do they want two bedrooms? Do they want three bedrooms? Why do they want two bedrooms? Do they want four bathrooms, etc. So it's you're always kind of disconnected from that, that very end user. But yeah, we work on, on multiple. This is an example of a project in Tustin on the Tustin Legacy, or what used to be the Tustin Air Base. This is, a, these are row homes, right? So we would, we would work on projects from single family to multifamily to, uh, you may have heard the term like Texas wrap, or like a parking structure with apartments wrapped around it. Um, five over two, which is like our apartments, five levels of apartments with two levels of parking structure underneath it. So all, all across the board. That's why I say I was very lucky to be exposed to a lot of different stuff. I started to get into what are called pocket neighborhoods. And this is um, kind of that nice nexus point. So like you saw, I worked on some projects that were really big and large master plans. And then I worked on some just sing single family, individual homes. What I really enjoy are what are called pocket neighborhoods, which is a term coined by an architect up in the Seattle area. And basically these are small parcels of land, let's say from one acre to maybe 10 acres, maybe normally a little bit smaller, five acres-ish. And the idea is to sort of recreate that idea of like the little village. So you've got multiple homes that are kind of facing each other and they've got nice expansive porches and that the neighbors actually know each other as opposed to everybody just pulling into their garage, shutting the door as quickly as they can and then they're in their, then they're in their own realm. They're usually oriented around a muse or a commons or some type of a little uh, outdoor feature that provides that semi-private space. Obviously, it can be private inside your home, semi-private on your porch, or, 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 or public space out, out of the commons. So. Next. And then I mentioned I, I do a lot of illustration, or I guess I used to, for, for projects. This is a mixed-use project in, uh, in the Newport, Newport Harbor. Anyway, that's a little bit about my background. I'm not sure if we have any more after that. I do some watercolor and, uh, and illustration for different parts. But let me open up a different file and show you a sample project, which I think might be pretty pertinent to, to this group. I think we figured out this. Okay, so I worked a lot with a company in my previous life called uh, Warmington Residential. I don't know if anybody's heard of that group. They're, they're still around there in Orange County. They're a, what I would call a mid-sized home builder, um, traditionally family owned, and uh, as opposed to like one of the big national builders. Uh, these guys found a niche hunting smaller parcels of land, maybe 10, 15, up to 50 acres, let's say, especially in the Inland Empire. And uh, this was kind of in the 2000, oh yeah, okay, 2014. So post last recession, let's say, right? And, and obviously a while ago now. But um, this was a home builder, traditionally home builder, they would do custom homes. And then what they started to do was to branch into land development. So as opposed to just building a home and selling it to the end user, they would actually look for pieces that they could take through the city process and then uh, either build themselves or sell. So they found two ways to, uh, to make money. Um, this is a project, I forget exactly how big it is, but essentially it was um, farmland. The city had already zoned the property to be upzoned from agricultural to some type of a residential, maybe like a medium density residential. So that was a big plus in the, in the, in the marketing sense. Um, and the idea is that we would start with a program. Well, what's a program? So the, the builder or the, or the land developer would go out and they'd be hunting, hunting parcels, looking at the listings, talking to people, 
and uh, let's say they would find a parcel that they thought they could fit a certain number of homes on. So the program essentially would tell us, okay, Simon, we've got five acres, we want to try to fit, uh, let's just say five times 10, we want to try to fit 50 homes on there. What can you do? So can you go through a few slides? I think you might have to go, we might have to skip some of, what we can come back to this, I think maybe 10, just keep going for the moment. I'll come back and show you some of this cool stuff. Go one more, please. Okay. So this is a pretty regular parcel, pretty rectangular, got a large major street here with our, with our central access point. So the first thing we would do is we would create a, a site plan. This one's a bit of a technical site plan, it's a little bit further down the road, but the first things we would do is create a uh, you know, concept plan, just <coughs> sketching out, hand drawn. And we'd say, okay, you want to try to fit 50 homes on here of a certain size and find that sweet spot where we've got a little bit of park area, because we've got to have some recreation area. We've got to have streets. We've got to have access into the garage. We, uh, you know, parcels just like uh, just like a single family home have to have setbacks. So we've got a front setback, or we've got a rear setback. We've got side. We've got lot coverages. We've got building heights. We have all of this criteria that goes into one one uh, parcel. In then or in, in that, then we try to figure out, okay, what's a, an efficient roadway? what's an efficient use of the space to try to get as many homes on here as we can. And really what it comes down to is, I'm sure everybody has heard this, that housing prices are so high, right? And the, and the distances between homes are so limited. And how is it that you guys are constantly trying to cram in so many homes on one piece of land? And really the end result is, unless we get that number of homes on there, we can't get the sales price down low enough to where anybody who is a non, what do you call it? Well, we're all mortals, right? Non-God <laughs> can afford to actually live here. And that's what most people don't understand is that when we were dealing with, especially with Irvine Company land, which in 20, 2006, 2008 was worth like $4 million an acre. And I don't even want to know how much it's worth nowadays. And you, I mean, if you fit four homes on one acre, those are still million dollar homes in 2008, 2009 era. Right, let's say it's twice that amount now. So if you've got X number of acres, you've got to get Y number of homes on there to get that price down to a reasonable amount. Isn't the formula uh, land is one third the cost of homes? Yeah, it, it varies pretty wildly. From what I've seen, well, I can't say. I can't say whether that's the quick formula or not. So I'll just defer and say that you're the expert. What from what I see is that. Everything that our home builders sell is square footage of the home, right? So in essence, the land value and the patio and the porch and everything that's non-living area, the garage, doesn't count in towards their sales, right? So they're trying to fit <coughs> as much living area on that piece of property as they can because that's what they actually sell. Who determines the criteria? Is it the city? Uh, yes. Okay. So in this case, this is city of Ontario, um, and Ontario said, okay, we've got a lot of we've got a big bunch of uh, agricultural land. We have a huge housing demand. We have to meet the state housing criteria for a certain number of units being built every year. We're going to upzone this property, or we're going to at least incentivize the upzoning of this property. And but oh, by the way, we've still got to have this amount of open space and this amount of you know, area for ventilation. We can't have it be like, a, you know, like, a, well, we can't, we can't have it be unhealthy, basically. It's still gonna be safe, it's still gonna be healthy, it's still gonna be usable. And they increase the density. They increase the density. And they go from, let's say, this was agricultural zoning to a residential mixed use or residential medium density zoning. I was gonna ask you, the agriculture zoning, I had one one time, but it, it, sometimes it takes a long time because the city has to, We've done that area, right? Exactly, exactly. So, a big part of our effort would be to help that city rezone that area. That takes time. It does. So, typically, these planning projects, even on this scale, would run two, maybe three years, right? As opposed to if you just bought a piece of land and you wanted to put a home on it, you might be able to get that done in a year, right? Quick. And if you're doing a remodel, which we do a lot of home additions and remodels, you might be done in six months, right? So, it's you know, it can it can vary pretty wildly. With this type of thing, let's say the city's on board, 
then you're not having to even do um, community outreach meetings. I worked on projects in Oceanside, for example, you know, a block from the water, and we spent a couple years just doing community outreach and trying to get everybody's opinions on the table and have big whiteboards where we're writing down everybody's concerns about traffic and parking and, um, you know, NIMBYs, right? Everybody who's coming into our neighborhood. Yet, meanwhile, the cities have to achieve a certain number of unit count per year, otherwise they're going to get sued. So they're kind of stuck in between. A uh, question, you know, so when they're doing this kind of development, this planning with such a small space, you know, like the city of Ontario, for example, are they taking into account like school districts and, and police and fire and putting in infrastructure overall in the city for adding this kind of housing? Absolutely. Or do they, okay, so they are Absolutely. And, and sewer making sure the whole infrastructure. Absolutely, is that's a wonderful question. So a big part of the impact fees and a big part of the development are impact fees and it's all to go to that, to upgrade sewer, to upgrade uh, fire departments, schools, school, uh, every, every lot or every home sold has a, has a fee that goes to the school district. Um, absolutely. So, and usually what that's done is you're just, you're paying fees just, you're just paying fees because it's not that they're going to then build a school here. Right, is that every project that gets done, it goes into a big bucket, and then the district and the city are deciding where those schools go, for example. So this one uh, pays in fees as opposed to having to build the schools. Were you going to ask something? Oh, no, I was just thinking about it, you know, because I was thinking about the property taxes. A lot of times people say one and a quarter percent of the sales price, but usually it's about 1.375, 1.4 as their average because of all the other fees. Right, right. That, and that doesn't even get into plan check fees or um, inspection fees or anything else that the city is assessing while the, while the development is going on. So on, on this type of project, our biggest goal would be what's called entitlement. So we're basically taking the project from raw land to an entitled piece of property that the city says, okay, you're now permitted to build X number of units maximum on this site. Sometimes developers, what they'll do is they'll come in, they'll, they may actually eventually build 40 instead of 50 and they'll you know, increase the size of each of the homes because two, three, maybe five years have gone by and the market has shifted, right? So they're, they're essentially trying to cram in a maximum and then if they come in and they build less, that's fine. You know, nobody minds if there's less traffic, uh, more open space, all that kind of stuff. Do these housing projects have to go to uh, Sometimes, depending on the size and depending on their potential impact. Out in these areas, a lot of times we would get what's called a neg deck or a negative declaration because either the project wasn't big enough or because the, um, the impact wasn't, wasn't big enough to, yeah, significant enough. But yeah, on, on large master plans, you know, if you're designing a, um, uh, gosh, a new city, right, or, or a new annex to a city, of course, yeah, then you're going to be tied up and that's another few years at least, okay. right? Yeah. Not to mention the California, uh, where, where the beaches are. The right, right, don't even coastal try it. Yeah, yeah, Coastal Commission, yeah. right, right, don't even try it. And yet somehow, you know, there's plenty of development going on in those works. So we would design first a site plan, figure out the efficiency, figure out what's the right unit size. These ones ended up being uh, one and two story homes. Um, you can see it's, it's pretty much, it's a very efficient layout. Um, and then from there, like I said, Warmington type was the type of project where they would then build them. From there, we would get into the architectural design. So once we got through planning review, planning, um, what's it called, planning commission, and then city council, now we would have an entitled project. They could either sell that piece of property off or they could, they could build it themselves. And Warmington would typically build it themselves. Then we would be into the building department going through all of that you know, uh, rigmarole, and into the public works department. And, uh, and then now we're looking at floor plans and elevations, and, and if you want to go back a few slides. And typically you build yeah. models. Yeah. So we used to do physical models. A lot of times nowadays we're doing 3D models, you know, just virtual models. Um, this was in the days where I would use SketchUp. I don't know if you've heard of that program. So we would basically take the floor plan, extrude that up, create the, the elevations, the facades, and we would all use all of this in the entitlement package to get that, that piece of property entitled. And then it would serve double use because then when we were in for the building department, we already had floor plans and sections and elevations and all that done. Um, what else can I tell you? 
And then on top of that, we would do, we would have landscape architect, obviously to do the, the, the parks and the, what are called the parkways or the, or the green areas. You'd have civil engineering involved in order to do the drainage, sewer connections, all the utility connections. You've got geotech uh, uh, engineers involved to test the soils. Um, so it's a whole host of, of, of characters. Contrast this to, let me see if I can show you something. So they would basically have to bank that the, the whole time. You're exactly right. So they would, they would. I don't know exactly how the financing worked, right? That's not my area of, of expertise. But from what I would overhear, they would essentially have to get loans in order to purchase the property or at least purchase the option on the property. They would have to be paying down that that debt while all of this is going on. So possibly two years, maybe even longer with the hope of then getting the entitlement to then build and then basically fund back that original loan. So yeah, they were putting in uh, a lot of money up front in order to get to that to the end goal to be able to sell the homes. That's why if they're not specifically home builders and they're land developers, they might also be doing all of that loan and all of that banking, but then with the idea of once they're entitled, they sell the property. And then they don't have to wait to get through the building department. They don't have to set, they don't have to uh, get through all of the plan check and actually build until making before making money. They can sell them now. They're free and clear. They're off to something else. I, I love, you know, I did this quick math. That particular project, fifty homes, it would have been a gross of twenty-five to thirty million dollars if you just did the the end. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's what I'm just gonna kidding. Curious as to what do they put into it? What are they looking at the return? And yeah. My my guess is there's at least a forty percent margin in there for them. Maybe. Yeah. Let me show you something a little bit smaller. Um, this is a project. Oh, also in Ontario, just by chance. Um, this is for a different company. Can you cycle through? I don't remember this one exactly, sorry. So this one is off of Euclid, which is a pretty major uh, street out there. And uh, this site was already zoned for medium density residential. So the nice thing about this one is the, the investors had found a piece of property that had, I think, maybe one or two single family homes on it. And they didn't have to worry about going through the whole upzoning rigmarole by right they were going to be able to put x number of homes on there like let's say i don't know let's, let's say it's 14 or, or something like that so they were instantly going to be able to go from like two to, to 14 or something like that can you go next keep going so um in this case to, in order to fit the, the maximum we decided to do townhomes so the previous project was also they were all single family detached these ones are our townhomes when you get into multifamily, it's a different different ball game, right? You've got um, if you're going to build it, you've got to carry that uh, carry that liability for the ten years. I think is the insurance is what typically you have to you have to carry on on the buildings. Um, multifamily involves other disciplines. We've got mechanical engineer, plumbing, electrical plumbing engineer. You've got dry utilities and wet utilities. You've got ADA that you have to be concerned about. Parking is a much bigger deal. I don't mean to scare you, you can definitely do it. It's just, it's a, it's a much bigger deal than single family. Um, but we've still got some of the other normal requirements. We have to have recreation area, we have setbacks, we have lock coverage, we have building heights. And we've still got to convince the city that what we're putting in here is, is gonna be nice, it's gonna be, it's gonna sell. In the previous project, the end goal was to sell all of those 50 lots and homes. In this project, the end goal was to retain them. They were going to uh, develop the land, build the townhomes, and then retain them and, and lease them out. So very different uh, financial structure. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in that same sense, we designed, I think, three plan types. One was like a studio, one was a two-bedroom unit, and one was a three-bedroom unit. So we could try to hit different markets. Uh, 
much smaller site, so we didn't have a lot of room for you know big roads running around. Basically, we have one main drag coming down that ends on a little a little open space at the end, and then each of these are the are the townhomes and a little recreation area at, at the beginning. Can you cycle through a couple? So here's a little sketch to show kind of as you're coming into the neighborhood what those look like. This is Ontario, so they had sort of a and, and Euclid Avenue, so they had um, a lot of historic examples of craftsmen buildings in that area uh, from post World War II. So we tried to design it in that vein, but we also had to be careful that we don't go too far because craftsmen, in case you don't know, is usually an expensive style to build with a lot of exposed wood and pretty heavy eaves and, and uh, a lot of beautiful trellises and things like that. So the gingerbread as we call it, we have to be careful as to how much we put on. Enough for the city to say, okay, that's gonna look good in our city, and not so much that now it becomes cost prohibitive for the, for the owner of the building. Uh, can you go a few more? See if this, that might be, okay, so here's just some floor plans to kind of just show you. I know it's really small on the screen, but basically same process. We would look at how many homes are we trying to fit on here? What's the right type of home? What's the height and the density? Uh, what's the right site plan? And then we get into the floor plans and the architecture, and then we get through all that and we're into the city getting a plan check. And ultimately they can either develop it or uh, build it or, or sell it. Let's see what else. What types of projects are you guys usually looking at? Oh, the big thing is I'm ready to environmental. You know, you have to do the environmental report, and that's it's 70, 80 grand. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't believe how much the environmental people get. It's a lot of money to have to pay. What types of projects are you finding out? Well, right now, I'm doing, we're doing a subdivision of Rancho Mirage. Okay. That's one of my clients. I sold them the land. Okay. We're gonna sub, I have a civil engineer subdividing it for them. Yeah. And then we're going to do the environmental. Yeah. And after the environmental, we're going to sell them the nine lots. Uh-huh. To somebody who wants to buy them. Yeah. And the same thing in, in Riverside. Okay. But every, all the cities are asking for environmental. Mm. That takes a long time. Yeah. You got to look for the wild, you know, all the, you know, the spotted owl and all these other little things you have to look for. <laughs> That's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. And all, and the, I mean, there's so many different things. It's harder here in California than anywhere else. That's it's crazy. absolutely true. It cost, it cost like $4,000 just for the report for the spotted owl. Oh, wow. Did you, you find any? They not, but I didn't buy it, but environmental people do all the yeah. potential. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the yeah. thing is, is they, they charge every little, I mean, I couldn't believe it. It's like seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, and I got three bids, and they're all sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. It's expensive. That's a lot. Yeah. In my eight, 18 and a half years with the Cal EPA as an environmental uh, scientist, I mean, when I went out to do an inspection in a landfill, I had to know what species Right. Yeah. And if, uh, if there were crows on the working face, I had to give them a, a violation because there were desert tortoises that were attacked by the crows. Oh. And so, I mean, it's, you're right. I mean, California, but, you know, we're living in a pristine state for the most part. I mean, we do have our vermins with the lead problems and so forth. But for the most part, California is in better shape environmentally than most of the rest of the country. Yeah. I would imagine a lot of times your choices are finding an infill piece of property that probably doesn't have that type of issue or not as strong of an well, issue. Well, the thing is, it's always an issue, but you don't know. Right. Even when you buy it, right. you really don't know. I mean, the pe people invested in the property, they yeah. bought it on the speculation that they're going to build. Yeah. But you don't know until you finish all the reports. Until you get into it. A lot of builders, what they do, like one of my clients, he's a civil engineer in L.A., he he had a piece of property in San Bernardino. He sold for 5.3 million, but he sold and this raw piece of land. But he sold it because the builder said, "I'll build, I'll buy the property for 5.3, but after I get the full entitlement." Right. So he said, "I'll do a year. I'll do a year escrow." Yeah. Until you get the entitlement, right. and then you pay me. Right. And then they they finished the entitlements within a year, year and a half, and they paid him. That's good. That's pretty quick. A lot of times I would see projects where um, if it were raw land, they would be available for sale for one price. If they could get it entitled, that price would be quite a bit higher. And if they had it to where they had plans approved, ready to build, it would be even higher. So the choice of the investor was, where do I want to stop, <clears throat> right? Do I want to just 
sell raw land, buy and sell raw land, like buy, buy it, sit on it because prices are going up and then sell it and make a profit, or buy it and title it, then sell it, or buy it and title it, get the plans approved, and then sell it. Oh, you want to sell after the plans are approved? If they, because if you get a project entitled for 50 units, let's say, uh, but you don't have plans that have gone through the building department, they might say, well, you can get 50 units, but, but what, now I still got to go hire an architect and a planner and all those kinds of things. Or you can get them approved, permit ready, you know, blue top ready, permit ready, that's a different price. So we would see that. But right. I'm kind of on the outside of that conversation. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the more you develop it, the better, the more you can sell it. Right, right, yeah. You know, I was wondering, um, is there like certain cities that you know are more lenient in approving things? And, and then the other thing I was going to ask is, you know, we moved to Thousand Oaks 30 years ago. I live here now, but um, I remember, I know now because 30 years ago was the North Ridge earthquake I just saw today. And they were, they were known for like slow, slow growth. And I don't even know if that's even, is that still, still something thing. that goes on? Absolutely. Every yeah. city is different. Mm -hmm. um, and surprisingly so, I mean, you guys know all of our context here. It's like sometimes you can't tell one city from the other. So it's not as though there's like this big open space swath and then the next city starts and you're like, oh, well, I understand why they don't want to develop anything. Um, every city is different because because we have humans in charge of it, right? So we have different political uh, ventures and we have different, uh, we have different, we have, let's say, community development directors that are pro-growth and community development directors that are anti-growth. And so, yeah, they, they are they are very different. Are there cities that are more uh, pro? Certainly, but I would say, in all of my years working, what I've come to find out is every project is different. You know, even, even if we even if we went back to this same site today, and they hadn't built anything on it, it would be a different ballgame, and it might change even while we're doing the project. So it's. It's, it's hard to answer uh, definitively, but what I what does work well is if you're considering a piece of property, go talk to the city and find out and tell them what you want to do and see what kind, what types of vehicles they have to help get you there. Because a lot of times we would find that uh, stuff that's in the code, you know, there might be other documents that they haven't published online, or maybe the planning director or the community development director really wants that piece developed for a certain reason, so they might be willing to work with you. Or, or just the opposite. So communication with the cities in these types of projects is, is vital and a good working relationship. Doesn't the financial help of the counties also determine their uh, interest in development? Probably. I mean, yeah. you've got some counties that are really in bad shape financially. Yeah. And some counties that are Yeah. Not. Yeah. I find a lot, uh, especially with ADUs, we you know we were talking about ADUs earlier. ADUs nowadays, uh, it can very wildly city to city whether they want them or not. And if they want them, they'll let you put them in the front yard, they'll let you put them on the second floor, you know, all, all kinds of things if they, in the garage. And if they don't want them, then they're not gonna let it, let you do it, even though the state law says you can, and it's like, okay, good luck, go fight that. Which they, you know, some people will. I was involved in a project that was going through a lawsuit in, in the coast, because you had Coastal Commission involved, you had uh, Coastal Zone, you had city, and, and, and they won. But you know, it took years. Right? So you do this. Uh, you have a client right now that wants me to do a uh, wants me to find someone to do like a uh, ADU, but it's in La Habra Heights. And so I joined the La Habra Heights, and they said you have to get an environmental uh, like a report for uh, your septic tank first. Okay. Before you submit your plan. Yeah. So do you do that kind of stuff? So what happens with septic is septic is typically based on the bedroom count of a of a piece of property, as opposed to how many homes are on there. And so what they'll do is say, okay, so-and-so, you show me that you have capacity to accept one or two more bedrooms in your existing system, or that you're gonna up that system in order to account for that. So if, you can, if you've still got paperwork, or they've got paperwork that shows what the capacity is versus the number of bedrooms on site now, then you should be, you should be okay. If you don't have capacity, you either have to augment that system or put in another, another, another system. system. Another system, yeah. I've got that on a project in uh, Temecula. In, the, in county land, but it's under the Temecula sphere of influence. Do you do that kind of stuff? So I don't do the septic study, but I've, I've been involved with projects where they where they have to get that first, absolutely. They have to get that first yeah. before they can submit the plans to the city. That's right. I just found this out because I just went there last week. Yeah. And so now he wants, because he wants to build an ADU, so I gotta find someone that actually does that, because I'm not gonna spend the time to do it. I might have a contact for you for the septic 
thing. I had a project that was in Joshua Tree, and they had to get all that sorted out first. So send, send me a text, oh, good. and I'll see if I've still got that contact. And I can we send had it to a speaker you. at Riyadh last week that does exactly that. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Okay. He does the whole process to get Oh, good. I need that guy. I'm not going to question. Yeah, but I mean, I haven't. Yeah. So if you're a member, you can request a copy of this presentation. So what kinds of projects are you guys usually involved in? I do most of raw land. Yeah. Raw land. Um, but what I also do with my raw land is um, I speak with the local governments on what they're zoning, land use, potential is for the land. Mm -hmm. and that's about as far as I go with it. If okay. I go any further, then I'm stuck in a, a legal quagmire. You know, well, for me, I'm giving somebody an idea. You can, you can, no, you can't. And that kind of thing. And that way I help my clients that are selling, attracting better opportunity to close an escrow mm -hmm. rather than someone coming in there. And, for example, I had one where uh, we went in to ask who they were going to put in a, a single family, a junior ADU, and a detached ADU, and those brought this zone rural living um, area, Joshua Tree, and all of a sudden at the very end of it they said, oh no, we're putting in an RV park, so we want to get out of the escrow, and we said, bite me, you know, we're keeping the money, you know, you didn't listen to anything, and then you, you know, but, you know, that's kind of where, I'm, if they told me that from day one, we wouldn't have gone down that road. Right, right. So, so, so Greg, how do you protect yourself from liability in that situation? Do you have a seller in the default to see when you get the information that you have a seller default to see? Well, I, I gather all the information from the, this is, this is Joshua Tree's county, so, and then it has a self-set in the county called a, uh, for all intents and word, village. Uh, but everything's under the county and they have a certain criteria they want to maintain. So I, I just get the information from the county, the land use and planning division. They email me everything and then I keep it on a file, keep an electronic file. And then I can go through and read everything that's in there. Right. I have a pretty good idea of what they'll do or what they won't do. It really does vary where in the village, city, or county it is. I mean, you know, yeah. across the street, I, I had a project in towards San Diego, what's it called, Fallbrook area. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's two apartment complexes and a guy who owns a, um, like an auto body repair shop. And he's like, well, I wanna do a, an apartment complex. And, but literally the zoning line is right on his property. So even though the apartment complexes were by right able to do whatever, he would have to go through a whole upzoning process. Right. So I, I told him, I said, you know, we gotta, let's reach out to the city first and see if they wanna, support you on that and I don't think they did I think that kind of went awry but yeah it could vary it varies within a small area so. and some of the property I was just speaking of is right on 29 Palms Highway and the owner of the property says well this is a perfect place for commercial because you're right on a major thoroughfare right but the county says no we don't want to create pockets of commercial surrounded by pockets of residential right and they said, now if you get the eight other lots in a row, they all want to do it, then we'll create a PUD. Right, planned unit development. Commercial planned unit development. Right. Everybody has to develop in the same concept. Right, yeah. So I, you know, I pretty much got a good idea of what, you want to do what? No. <laughs> well, I think it, it depends on scale too. I mean, if yeah. you, you know, you're and your clients and we're individuals and we're not looking at those types of things, whereas some of the bigger, companies, you know, they may be able to spend the multi-million dollars or get loans for those to go do exactly that for, you know, 30 or different, 30 or 40 different landowners and have them all pull together. But that's, you know, that's a major effort. Yeah. Well, that, this particular PUD would be close to 40 acres, and, you know, because of the incentives. Right, yeah. right. So it's not a, not a small jump. Yeah. What, what I tend to come across more nowadays are folks uh, that may buy one single family lot and try to maximize the number of rents they can get out of that lot. So that may be one home, 
an SB9 unit, an ADU, and a junior ADU. So four rents out of one lot. So we're seeing more of that. So that was my question. If I wanted to come to you and I got a piece of land and I want to do just that, would you do that? Yeah, absolutely. We do that all the time. So you, you take it from the ground up and fix would, the whole project? We basically don't build. So I would take it from zero to permit. Okay. And then all along that time, I could have you in contact with people that do build so that before you even get to that end goal, you already know how much you're going to spend and what, you know, who's going to build it and, and you feel comfortable with that. How long would it take to do one of those right now? I mean, from just, like just raw land? Yeah. Um, I would give yourself a year. Yeah, I would give yourself a year. Complete the whole thing? Yeah, maybe a year, maybe a little bit more. I mean, so on projects like that, usually, let's say they're mere mortals like, like I am, meaning I don't have, you know, $10 million in the bank to just fund the whole thing. So what we may do is um, get the single family home done and permitted and get that under construction. And while that's going, start permitting the next unit and then use those rents to help pay for the ADU and those rents to pay for the junior ADU. So it may be a five year long project, let's say, um, but you're not having to shoulder that loan for that entire length of time. Or what happens most of the time, because we all know our areas are so built out, is that there's already a lot with one home on it. And so I had a customer say, well, should I do a tear down? And I said, no, keep that, because you can keep that rent coming in to help fund the other stuff and then just keep building on it. So it what was the depends. first thing you said? The first, you had the ADU and the junior ADU? What was the first Oh, thing? so the main homes are the primary residence, which just be a single family home. Yeah. And then the second one that a lot of people are getting to is what's called SB9 yeah. or an SB9 unit. I don't know if you guys have heard that terminology yet. Yeah. yeah. And what is that? So SB9 kind of, it's a, it goes to a fork in the road. It's basically a second unit like an ADU but it has some benefits of an ADU, like small setbacks and lock coverage stuff, and then it has some advantages that an ADU doesn't have. It can typically be two stories. Um, and SB9 can either be just a second unit, or you can actually take a piece of property and split it, like a subdivision, and it's called an SB9 lot split. And then on each of those lots, now you can have a main home and a second unit. Are these always investments, or is it the primary residence? Is it it's a mix. I would say probably, it used to be like 99% of the projects I would see come in would all be um, uh, for, for self, like for family, let's say, maybe like some uh, customer and their family. Um, but now it's becoming more where people are looking at rental opportunities. So they may not even live on that site and they're already renting out the main unit and they're just looking to add on rents. But Who's that, doing the financing on those? Do who, who does it? Yeah. Like, uh, we, we have some contacts who, who do that. Yeah, I say we meaning Ben and Jessica and I from, from another group. But. Yes. Scott, to add on to that, under that SBA, SB9 and the ADU, I'm putting an ADU on a property, California now allows those ADUs to be sold separately, as, but they have to be sold as a condominium unit. Mm -hmm. So you could, you could have a house with a, with a lot, you build an ADU on it, and then you decide at some point in time you don't want to rent it out, you want to turn around and monetize it further and sell it, sell it as a condominium unit. So I thought that it's all, but it's, if the municipality allows it, I thought it was per municipality. Like California's saying you're allowed to do it all, as small as the All that now is under the California Housing and Development Agency, which is the same people that run the mobile home park business. They're the ones that got the enforcement tools and the, and the ability to find and enforce people to be the ability to do that. I will tell you, I haven't come across anybody yet who's wanted to do that. Um, everybody that I've worked with, and that could just be my subset, has just wanted to use it for uh, rent rental. Yeah. And they do that mostly because they may build it for rental today, and then with the idea that in the future a family member will need it, or the opposite, for a family member today, and then that family member you know, may pass on and they want to rent it out. So it doesn't mean that it's not coming. So but that it, project you were doing in Long Beach? Um, yes. Wasn't he trying to maximize the number of rentals? Yeah, so this is a client, he's got a piece of property in Long Beach which is already a duplex, so that's two units, and we are just about to get permitted two ADUs. So he'll have, a, uh, he'll have four units total. Um, his original goal was to try to do an addition to the duplex to get other junior ADUs on there, but the city wouldn't go for it, even though it's in an incentivized zone. Um, so as a rule of thumb, if you think of one single family property, you can eventually get four rents out of it as a, as a maximum. 
there are other laws that are coming that are not totally formed up yet. I think one's called SB 10, where you may be able to subdivide and get like, I think 10 units or something, but that one is at a city's discretion and it, it has to be like in a, you know, an incentivized zone. And I haven't, I've started projects on that route, but they haven't really gotten anywhere to be honest. Yes. Are you sorry? Yeah. So there are certain ahead. cities where it would be difficult to get cooperation like Huntington Beach? You know, a lot of people complain about Huntington. I've, knock on wood, I've always had a really great relationship with Huntington and I haven't had any problems getting stuff done there. Uh, whole, whole house remodels, ADUs, and stuff like that. Um, maybe it's just been the luck of the draw. Some cities definitely are more pro. Your Belinda is. Uh, is very pro ADU. Uh, Buena Park is not. It's very anti ADU. Um, Dana Point is challenging. San Clemente is really challenging. But really, all of them have by right situations. So it's just a matter of finding what the city will will allow you to is do. There parking issues like you have ADUs. Parking parking is usually an issue. But in most cases, in our in our areas down here. We're within a half mile of the bus stop, and so that um, eliminates the need for parking. And in most cases, where that doesn't apply, if you've got a two-car driveway, you know, a, a 16-foot wide by 18-foot wide driveway, that counts for ADU parking. The, if you get up, yeah, just single. If you if you have a single driveway, yeah, usually, usually is if you have a driveway, that will count for the for the parking for the ADU. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't have to be logical, meaning you know you can't get your car out of the garage. Get you out, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The law is not logical. Knock on the guy, don't you move your car? That's right. Yeah, so and, the car, it has to and there's there's nobody enforcing it. It yeah. just has to be shown on the plan. Well, what I can do is I can put a line or something and get the yeah. hour that you can be parked there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but all the cities and counties in California are under the state mandate for. Housing. They and are. The state is demanding that every county build so many units right. that the counties divided up among the cities, <clears throat> right. incorporated cities within them, right. and also unincorporated land. Right. And so they have to comply. They do. And I mean, even though Huntington Beach is suing the state, they're going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. I think you have the same old human nature, though, right? Like if somebody forces you to do something, you resist. Yeah. Right. If if you're brought on board and made a part of it, you're more likely to try to try to help out. With that. And then you find out you're like said, mom and dad were right. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question though. When you say that the SB9, is there a minimum lot size? So I mean, can you take a six thousand square foot lot and put four units on there? Six like thousand sounds like it'd be fine. Uh, there there may be. I I don't have so, a whole okay, so, code memorized. So okay, so check. So it's not just yeah. automatically. Yeah. A, a piece of property that's right. just on a single calendar there has to be enough of yeah, minimum lot. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I can tell you, I, <clears throat> County, it's a minimum 10,000 square foot lot size to do that. I haven't come across any projects where we haven't been able to do it for that reason. Okay. Um, but what a lot of my clients do is they'll call me up and they'll send me a, uh, a listing, let's say, or a, an address, and I can pull it up on Google. And kind of find out within a day or so as to where they're, what what their possibilities are. That that happens in very So if you turn your parking, talking about the parking, one of those wonderful new laws that are in here. Um, larger communities with multiple dwellings on it, you can no longer have assigned parking spaces. So they can add more to the community as long as there's parking. Parking's a big deal. Yeah. Parking is probably one of the biggest deals for cities, and that's one of the biggest vehicles that they use uh, to promote or demote development. Mm -hmm. um, now, that being said, has anybody done an ADU in multifamily projects? So in multifamily, you can replace parking with units, which is like burning the candle at both ends, right? So in Fullerton, Garden Grove, Huntington, uh, we've done projects where we replace, in multifamily, we replace garage spaces with ADUs. So we're reducing parking and adding units, but that's the that's the demand from the from the state law. Yeah, someone built a house in Bullitt with 11 bedrooms. Wow. They didn't, they wanted to do like 
you know, like rent them out, but yeah. they now the city found out about yeah. it. So. Yeah. And we, you know, speaking of that, we inherit a lot of projects that are either non-permitted ADUs that they want to get permitted, or projects that uh, maybe another designer has started, and then once they get into the city and they get plan check comments, they don't know how to deal with them, and so we'll end up picking up the project. And then you've got, you know, people that are stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? They've already started the project, they're already, they thought they already had the design done, they're in the city plan check, and they're like, what do you mean you don't know how to answer those questions? A lot of it is due to the fact that California has either a third or a quarter of all the homeless in the United States. They don't want homes, come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those political problems. We don't want to do yeah. Hundred bucks. <laughs> That's right, yeah. yeah. Hundred yeah. dollars. They have a lot of ADUs in LA, a lot of them on the streets. Yeah. Yeah. LA, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. The cost involved yeah. in having yeah. you get involved in a project and get to a very good question. Okay, so let's take a sample project. Let's say the first one that I showed where the where the landowner was or where they were hunting land and they wanted to try to see how much how many units they could get on there, for example. We typically do a retainer fee of around two thousand five hundred dollars to do some site planning work to at least see what can the site yield, right? Um, from there, uh, for a big project like that, like 50 units or so, I would say a, an investor could probably expect to spend on different consultants probably around 100K, maybe 150K, um, between architect, engineer, surveyor, geotech, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. Up the architect part of that? We would do the architecture. And the architecture for a project like that might be around 35 to 45,000 of that amount. You reduce that down to a much smaller project, let's say like a single family lot, and we want to try to get an ADU and a junior ADU and stuff. Most people are spending for the architectural fees probably around 10,000. Um, and then you've got structural engineering in Title 24, so for a project of four units, you might be spending around 15,000, 16,000 or so, maybe a bit more. So obviously it's a, you know, it's a much much smaller scale. Um, but we'll do, we'll do several projects where you know, just sort of like, let's say the retainer is, is maybe 2,000, 2,500, and then you can determine what can you really do with that property. Keep in mind those architectural fees that Simon was just talking about. If the property you're doing is in an opportunity zone, and you have to, you have to, you, you require for action, you have to put in at least twice what you required it for. All those soft costs like that include, are included in those opportunity zones. Uh, up costs to do the project. That's a good point. I get told pretty often we fall in the middle. There are some folks that do it for you know an amount less, and then there are some folks that are living on the Newport coast and they're charging a lot more just because of where they're based. But I, we hear all the time that we t tend to fall right to that. What did you mean by buy right? When you said something about buy right, buy right, mean? meaning the zoning is already allowing for let's say up to 18 units per acre or 10 units per acre, so you don't have to try to upzone the property. So you, let's say you're looking at a piece of land and it's zone R2, and you can do 10 units per acre, then you don't, you don't have to go in and try to prove to the city that, you've got a, that, uh, that you need to get 10 units per acre. It's by right, you can do that. Yeah. What are the prices you get for building costs? You brought it down about three, four, five hundred dollars. So nobody likes to answer that question because <laughs> because they never they'll never get it right. I tell people that if you're doing a home addition, um, try to start with around two hundred fifty to three hundred a square foot. Uh, if if you're doing new construction uh, for like let's say a, a higher end, um, I've got a project in Rancho Santa Fe and it's up in the hills and the you know. They're doing a new home that's around 5,500 square feet. I told them probably 350 to 400 a square foot. Um, and then if it's really high end, it can, it can go up quite a bit from there. But usually 250 to 300 a square foot is a good starting point. And that tends to give people a little bit of a cushion because what happens is you'll call up builders and they'll, they'll, you know, they'll give you a price at $150 a square foot and then they're just tacking on, you know, fee after fee after fee. Yeah, I get all different prices. I got four, five, six. Yeah. What I what I do is we do projects in three phases. So let's say we were going to do a single family home, custom home. The first thing we'll do is some concept plans, and you can start to show those to a builder and get some get some bids. 
They're going to be loose bids, right, because there's not a lot of detail. Then we'll do our second phase and everything's in 3D and it's uh, computerized and they can get a more precise bid. And then when we're getting into engineering, you can do that again. And hopefully by that time you've gone from like, let's say five potential builders down to two and you can kind of compare and figure out. So you're not, you're spending some money to get there, but you're not, you know, you're not spending the whole basket. All right. All right. I'm, I'm really uh, impressed with Simon today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah.